for us this morning, everyone who sang and took part of that thank you, this congregation, for singing so well as we worship God together as a church. I love being at church. I'm glad we're here together, glad we can meet, and welcome those who are here, welcome those online who are not back with us yet, just a special welcome to everybody. If you have your Bibles, if you would turn to Genesis chapter number 50, Genesis chapter 50, uh, this morning, as we begin a new series in the in the this new sermon series in our theme, I Believe God. All year long we've been challenged, and typically Sunday mornings, on this idea to believe God. You say, Pastor, I've been saved a long time, and so why are you tell me to believe God? Because we walk by faith and not by sight. Because without faith, it is impossible to please Him. The fact is that no matter how long we've been saved, we still have to walk by faith. In all thy ways acknowledge him, he shall direct thy path. That path of faith never stops. I don't care if you've been saved one day, one week, or a hundred weeks, or a hundred years. We need to walk by faith. And this morning, I want to look at a man who in the Bible is named Joseph. Not Joseph, the husband of Mary, the earthly father of Jesus, but Joseph from the Old Testament. A familiar Bible character to many people. If you've been around church or in Sunday school, if you've grown up in Sunday school, you've heard about Joseph before. You've heard about how he had a coat of what? Anybody know? Many colors. You've heard about some of the things that he has done, some of the accomplishments in his life. I'd like to, over the next few weeks, look at some of the choices that Joseph made to believe God. And here it is, in spite of. In spite of. If you look, please, in Genesis chapter number 50, in verse number 19, the Bible says, And Joseph said unto them, that them is his brothers. He has now been in Egypt many, many, many years. In fact, over the course of his life, Joseph will have lived, by the time he dies, 93 years in the land of Egypt. 11 in the land of Canaan, and about 6 years where he was born. The majority of his life was spent in a country that he never wanted to go to. Never thought he would go to. Over 93 years now or will have spent in the land of Egypt. His father has passed now, Jacob, at this part of the account of the story. His brothers are certain that the only reason they're still alive is because Jacob has made Joseph keep them alive. And how they misunderstood what was going on. And they came to him and said, please forgive us all over again. And Joseph responds in verse 19, said unto them, fear not. For am I in the place of God? But as for you... Now there's a comma in my Bible. you have a comma in your Bible? you see that? I'm glad it wasn't you or me speaking right here. We'll look at over the next few weeks the, the turmoil, the issues that his brothers brought upon him. And if it was you or me responding right here, I wonder if that comma would be a long vocal pause. Am I in the place of God? But as for you, can you hear it? I don't think he did it that way. We see that by the next phrase. But it's a good thing it wasn't one of us because that's probably how we would say that. But as for you, but as for you, let me tell you what I think about you. Let me tell you the hurt that you caused me. Let me explain to you exactly what I'm going to do to you because of what you did to me. But as for you, you see, you thought you were big stuff back there, didn't you, boys? Not so big now, are you? I'm second in command here in Egypt. You thought you had a good plan. How's that working out for you, Reuben? But as for you... You thought that you had the upper hand. But as for you, Judah, but as for you, Simeon, but as for you, Naphtali, but as for you, Dan, but as for you, and my Bible has a comma, but I don't think Joseph paused very long here. He said in verse number 20, but as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. 
Joseph is a man of character. We'll see that over the next few weeks. He's a man of loyalty. He's a man of responsibility. He's a man of respect. He is a pillar of godliness in spite of, in spite of some things in his life. In spite of some hands that were dealt to him, that from the outside we would say, you know what, we would understand why you became bitter, Joseph. We would understand why you became angry at your family. We would understand why you became angry at your circumstances. But Joseph didn't do that now, did he? He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Or look at the next little bit, the in spite of circumstances. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Lord, I thank you for what you have done here already this morning in the service and in the Sunday school hour. Lord, I don't know the needs that are here this morning, but you do. I don't know the needs that are listening online, Lord, but you know those needs. And I pray that you'd help this morning as I try to preach your word. Lord, I need your strength. I need your power. Lord, I need that help from on high. The Holy Spirit enabled help. Lord, I can't begin to think that I'd be any help by myself. Lord, you help me today. Lord, all those who hear your word, whether they be challenged, encouraged, and strengthened by your spirit and through your word. Lord, do something during this time that only you can do. And we'll give you the praise and glory for it. Lord, I pray there's someone here who's never been saved, that they would not leave this service this time, whether in the auditorium or online, without trusting you. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. The fact is, we all have, in spite of, circumstances in our life, do we not? We can all uh, point back to times, and maybe even right now in our life, where there's a situation or circumstances that are not ideal. Can we not? Even when things are going well, we kind of live life waiting for the in spite of, uh uh-oh, life's going too well, so what's going to happen next? My car hasn't broken down recently, so uh, I'm skating on thin ice. I've not got a large bill. Uh Uh-oh, what is going on? Is it the calm before the, the storm? We kind of think that way if we're not careful. We all have or have had in spite of circumstances in our life. We know people who have had, who have been dealt some difficult hands in life and we've seen at times people react in a wrong way and become bitter at life. Bitter at those around them, sometimes bitter at God. Have you seen that? Someone who had the joy of life and the joy of the Lord now is just an angry, harsh, sour person. When you interact with them, Now, where their spirit was refreshing before, now it seems like their spirit sucks the very life out of the room. You feel for them, do you not? You hurt for them. You can kind of sometimes even understand it a little bit. I'm not excusing it, but you can understand it. You know what I'm saying? Say, wow, that had happened to me, I bet I'd be struggling too, in spite of circumstances. And we've seen people respond the wrong way. But sometimes you come across somebody and, and for where they're at and what they've been through, they're strangely different. Right? You hear their story and, boy, there's still a smile on their face. There's still a spring in their step and they're still faithful to the Lord and still in love with their Savior. You say, wow, that's a testament. That's a testimony Wow, that's amazing. Sometimes we'd say something like this, I could understand how you wouldn't respond so well, but how you did that, I can't, I can't understand that. I look at the life of Joseph and I see some areas, some ways that I look at it and say, Wow, Joseph, in spite of some things in your life, you stayed faithful to God. Joseph, instead of becoming bitter, became committed. There's a story about an elderly Christian man. He was a fine singer, as the story went. He learned that he had cancer of the tongue and that surgery was required. In the hospital, everything was getting ready for the surgery. And the man said to the doctor, he said, Doc, are you sure that I'll never sing again? The surgeon, the doctor, found it difficult to share the truth because the fact was going to be that after the surgery... It was a very small, slim chance he would ever sing again. 
He who had spent his life and his adult life singing for the Lord now would not be able to sing in what he'd done before. He who had found such joy in serving God and blessing countless and thousands of people could now no longer have the same ministry. And the doctor with a tear in his eye said, Yes, sir. Most likely you'll never sing again. And then this man surprised the doctor. He asked, he said, sir, may I sit up for a moment? I've had many good times singing the praises of God and his words, and now you tell me I could never sing again. I have one song that will be my last. It will be of gratitude and praise to God. And there in the doctor's presence, the man sang softly the words of Isaac Watts, the great hymn writer. The words go like this, I'll praise my maker while I've breath. And when my voice is lost, praise shall employ my nobler power. My days of praise shall never be passed. In spite of. In spite of circumstances. The fact is, we all have them. But this morning, the question I have to pose before you today is, what's your excuse? What's your excuse for not being faithful to God What's your excuse for, for not serving God? What's your excuse for becoming bitter at God, at, at what God has allowed in your life? What's your excuse? Because Joseph could have had a lot of excuses. And he never took the exit off the highway to bitterness, to resentment. I want to look this morning at a few areas. And the title of the message this morning is Dysfunction at Home. As we go throughout this, we're going to see a lot of it. I, at least I find that, and that's kind of the point I'll make out. But I found some dysfunction at home, and in spite of hardships at home, Joseph stayed faithful to God. If you would, turn back in your Bibles to Genesis chapter number 29. We're in Je Genesis 50, kind of the end of the story. And I want to dial us back now to the beginning of the story. You see, Joseph did not come from a perfect home. In fact, as we look at this morning, quite the opposite. In fact, the farther I got into this study, the more I realized that Joseph's home was dysfunctional. Definition of a dysfunctional home is something that is impaired or not working correctly. A family that is broken. There are times, there are times that all of our families are dysfunctional. There are times that every home in this room, and it's out of my voice, there are times that every family is dysfunctional, all right, for a variety of reasons. But there are some special times when some families seem to be broken all of the time. Yes? All of the time. On the way to church, at church, and on the way home. Monday morning when the alarm clock goes off, they're still broken. At lunchtime, they're yet broken once again. At home at supper, they're still broken. They're dysfunctional. For whatever reason, and Joseph came from such a home. It was a religious family. It was a called out family, but it was a broken family. If you would look where this starts, we see the first point today is that we see previous deceitfulness in his family. Look at Genesis 29, verse 25. You remember this when we read it, and it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he, that is Jacob, Joseph's father, said to Laban, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Did not I serve with thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? The father of Joseph, the name by the name of Jacob, was a very, throughout his life, till he got right with God, deceitful man. Early on in his life, he deceived his father and tricked his older brother out of the birthright. The birthright was a double blessing because there were two sons, Jacob and Esau. What would have been the custom of the time would have been to divide the inheritance into three parts and give two to the elder son and one to the younger son. It was a very sought after position, this, this birthright, this inheritance, not just monetarily, but they became the spokesperson for the family. When the father were to pass, the elder son or the one with the birthright would now take the leadership role in the family. And, and Jacob tricked his father Isaac and his brother Esau out of the birthright. How did he do it? Well, years before he tricked it because of his mother's help. His father said, it's time for me to give a blessing. And so, boys, you know I love, you know that I, that I love to eat, so go out there and then, uh, and then we'll eat. 
So his brother Esau was a tremendous hunter. All right, the brother of Jacob, Joseph's father. He went to the field, began to hunt, and, and uh, Rachel, or I'm sorry, Rebecca, his mother, Rebecca, his mother said, listen, I know how to get the birthright for you, son. Listen, I'm going to make some food. You go kill a goat and put the skin on your arms. You will then feel as hairy as your brother Esau. I've known some hairy people, but a goat? A goat? Is that what you use? You know, here, go grab that goat, and that'll, that, that'll, that's just like your brother. He, in, fact, in fact, we call him goat arms. Well, that's what he did. He came before his father, and his father being deceived by, by Jacob, the father of Joseph, gave him the blessing. Wow. Later on, Jacob had to come back to him. Because now Jacob is working for Laban. There's a pretty girl there by the name of Rachel. And he says, I'd like to marry her. And Laban says, all right, you can, but you have to work for me for seven years. You know the story. Seven years he labors, it seemed as if but a day. His heart was so in love with this woman, Rachel. And he, he gets married, he wakes up the next day, and it's not Rachel. That's the verse we read. Yikes. That's all I had to say to that. Yikes. There's a whole lot of jokes right there. We can go right there. You wake up the next day, oh my word, what have I done? Jacob obviously is in this verse is incensed. How could you trick me this way? I wonder at what point, at what point he realized that whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. We know that to be true. You see, in the, in the history of Joseph's family, there was some previous deceitfulness. This was not just an upstanding man who said, you know what, I won't do anything but serve God. This was a man, his father, who had some serious flaws. There was some serious deceitfulness there. We read about a story about a man by the name of Arthur Ferguson. No relation to the Fergusons here, of course. He stood one day in London's square and he watched an obviously wealthy American admire the statue of Admiral Lord Nelson, a statue on display there in the square in London. Arthur Ferguson noticed him and all of a sudden was struck with a sudden inspiration. You see, Arthur Ferguson was a tremendous salesman. He could sell, as they say, ice to an Eskimo. He saw this man admiring the statue, and so he decided to sell the statue to the man. Now, Arthur did not own the statue. And sure enough, he sold it to the, to the, the statue of Nelson, Lord, Admiral Lord Nelson, for about $30,000, including the lions. But not one to rest on his laurels, Ferguson went on. And he then went on to sell Big Ben, the famous clock. He sold it to another American for $5,000. He went on to another American to sell Buckingham Palace and took a down payment of $10,000 for that. By the time justice finally caught up with him, Arthur Ferguson had added and sold the Eiffel Tower, Tower and the Statue of Liberty to his list of amazing sales. Now, I don't know about you, but that's got to be a gift in some sense. To convince someone that you can actually buy the Eiffel Tower, the Statue of Liberty, Big Ben, Buckingham Palace, or a statue in a square? That, that's hefty. That's hefty. That's some deceitfulness. If I can't offer this up to you, Jacob seemed to have that same strain of deceitfulness in him. Joseph was born to a home in one sense that was broken. There was some previous deceitfulness, but there was also some personal discontentment. If we look in Genesis 30, Jacob finally is married to Rachel, the one he really wanted to anyway, so now he has two wives, Leah and Rachel, which as Pastor Let for years made a great statement, two wives is one too many. All right, Jacob must have lost his mind. Why would you want two wives, Brother Toby? This, I mean, you're nuts. You're nuts. Nuts. You say, well, he was tricked. He's still nuts. We just got back from the couple's retreat this weekend. Tremendous time. If you missed it this year, make your plans to be there next year. Wonderful time. But I love my wife. The way my wife can spend money, I couldn't afford two wives. 
I read this in the couple's retreat. They say that, uh, I found this a tweet, right? It was a tweet out there. They said that uh, a lot of couples have an allowance they can spend. The husband said, mine's $50 without asking my wife. My wife's apparently $623.47. No, my wife's very frugal. And I jest, of course. But in Genesis chapter 30, now they've been married, Jacob, Leah, and Rachel. And there was some discontentment here because God had withheld children from Rachel. Jacob, Joseph's father, loved Rachel more in verse 1 and 2 of Genesis chapter 30. When Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister. You see the discontentment. And said unto Jacob, give me children or else I die. Now, I've been asked some pretty amazing things throughout my life. But how do you do this one? Am I, and, J and, and Jacob responds correctly, Am I in God's stead who hath withheld thee from the fruit of the womb? You see, back then, society had said that the value of a woman was largely found in whether she brought male children to the marriage. Now, don't miss this point. Ladies and gentlemen, the value of human, all right, male and female, is set by God. We are all valuable because He has declared us to be valuable. Men are not more valuable than women, and women are not more valuable than men. We are equal in value because we're children in the sight of God. God loved the world. He doesn't love men more than women or women more than men. And sometimes society paints a wrong picture of value. We are in that time right now with some of the protests and movements. There's a time in culture, in history, that history and society said that certain people were more valuable and other people were less valuable. And that is wrong. That is never found in Scripture. Everyone is valuable in the sight of God. It doesn't matter what gender you are or what race you are. You are valuable to God. Anyone who says otherwise doesn't know the grace of God in their life. Whether society changes or not, it doesn't matter. God has declared black and white, all right? And whether you're, wherever you're from or Asian, wherever you're from, you are valuable in the sight of God. But society back then said, listen, you're only valuable as a lady if you bring male offspring. Rachel felt that. And said, listen, Jacob, I, I, I'm envying my sister, Leah. She's, she's popping out babies like they're free. And I want to give you a male son. Give me children or else I die. Jacob says, what? Well, am I in the place of God? Am I in the place of God? You see, there was some personal discontentment. See, sometimes we're discontent with what God has brought in to our life. Do this or else I will die. Am I in the place of God? Now, I don't know what has been allowed in your life. My friend, can I encourage you to be content with such things as you have? That is not just material things, though that is included in it. Be content with the material things that you have, with the material blessings that God has given to you. Sure, your car may not be as new as your neighbor's, but be content. And yes, you may not have as many shoes as another lady at church, but be content. And sure, your purse may not be as nice as someone else's, and men, your rifle may not be as nice as a buddy you're hunting with, but be content. And sure, on a material level, but on a spiritual level, but on an on a, on a emotional level, be content with what God gave to you. Be content. Paul says it this way, but godliness with contentment is great gain. You can wake up each morning and say, God is good. I may not have much or I may have a lot. God is still good. I may be healthy. I may not be, but God is still good. I may have exactly what I think I need or I may not have what I think I need, but God is still good. There was personal discontentment there. Joseph's parents were having some problems. Mom and dad weren't getting along. You see that? Mom and dad weren't getting along. You see, Joseph is from a dysfunctional family. It's broken. 
and Joseph's not even in the picture yet. And already this family appears to be a little bit broken. Continue on in Genesis chapter 30 and I see some poor decisions. There are times in the Bible that the Bible gives us an example or gives us a testimony of what people do. Not as a, as a list or instructions for us to do, but of what to avoid to do. Rachel decides to take matters into her own hands. She is so set on having children for her husband that she says, listen, husband to Jacob, I want you to marry my servant girl and have a child by my servant and marry her and then that'll be like my child and then I'll be a valuable wife to you. And Jacob said, okay. Terrible decision. Terrible decision. Poor decision. Wrong decision. Leah, her, her elder sister, the one who had children first, said, aha, well, I can do that as well. Jacob, my husband, take my servant girl as well. And now Jacob, who went from one wife to two wives, now goes to four. That's three too many in case you're still counting. Now there's a whole mess of things, a whole mess of problems, because they didn't do things God's way. You want to end up in a mess of things? Just do things your own way. You want to end up with a whole mess of circumstances and a whole slew of problems? Just do things your own way. Well, but look. Look, Pastor. It worked out. I got my child. Yeah, you did. But you made a heap of mistakes along the way. And we see people all the time. We see Christians who can't wait on God who can't wait for his help. They decide just to do things their own way and end up in a whole heap of trouble. And you know what usually happens at that point? They blame God. How could you let this happen to me, God? <laughs> and I'm not God. It's a good thing I'm not, all right? I know you can say amen to that. But I wouldn't be surprised if God said, my fault. Now, he's gracious and merciful. You're the one making the poor decisions. I see some poor decisions Boy, anytime we take matters in our own, ha own hands, we make a mess of things. But, but don't miss this, because we're not even a Joseph being born yet, but don't miss this. That even when we make a mess of things, God can still work. Aren't you glad that God does not just hang us out to dry? That God is pitiful, He is merciful, and He is gracious to us. His mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I'm so glad that God doesn't always say, fine, I'm done with you. Aren't you? Heard those testimonies this morning, right? Adam, aren't you glad God never said, I'm done with you? Amen. I'm glad. I love having uh, Brother Adam around here. He's helped us around the facilities. and you see this clean place? It's because of Brother Adam right there. I'm glad that God is gracious to us. And sure, uh, Brother Adam gave a great testimony, but that story could be for a lot of us who've made terrible mistakes in our life. Right, and we sit here smiling, but we're here only because of the grace and mercy of Jehovah. And I'm so glad even when we make a mess of things, which we are often apt to do. All right, and, and God will let us reap some of those consequences. And He doesn't just hang us out to dry. Oh, God can still work. We're like the, uh, <laughs> like the manager of a minor league baseball team. He was so disgusted with his center fielder's performance that he ordered the center fielder to dug out and he himself assumed the position in center field by himself. The first ball came to center field and took a bad hop and hit the manager right in the mouth. The next one was a high fly ball and uh, which he accidentally lost in the glare of the sun and it bounced off his forehead. The third was hit so hard line drive that he charged with the outstretched arms and unfortunately it flew between his hands and smacked him right in the eye socket. Furious, he ran back to the dugout, grabbed the center fielder, and shouted, You idiot! You've got center field so messed up that even I can't do a thing with it. <laughs> and that's how we treat the Lord sometimes. Let me be honest for a minute, can we not? Lord, you've got this thing so messed up that even I can't do a thing with it. Or the, well, the pastor who was moving into a new church. He'd saved the heaviest piece of furniture for last, his desk. 
He was pushing and pulling the desk with all his might and not making great progress. And all of a sudden, his four-year-old son came to give him a hand. And together they began to slide on the floor, still struggling just as much as he was by himself, until finally his son said, Dad, you're in my way, would you just move? And the four-year-old attempted to do it all by himself. Sometimes we're guilty of the same thing. God, you're in my way, will you just move? You see the poor decisions here? Joseph's not even born yet, and they're making a whole heap of problems for themselves, a whole heap of problems that'll plague them and follow them for years. There are personal disputes going on in here. Verse 8, we see with great wrestlings, Rachel said, I have wrestled with my sister. She goes, this whole thing is about me trying to beat my sister. I'm not trying to get one up on my sister. Rachel, you're missing the picture. You're missing what's going on. This family is broken. You say, well, Pastor, that's a lot of bad news going on. Well, let me leave you with some good news this morning. Look, if you would, in verse chapter, 20, or chapter 30, verse 22. It's three words right there. Three words. Chapter 30, verse 22. And God, what's that third word? Remembered. Who do you remember? The fourth word? Rachel. You think sometimes that God's not involved? God is still involved. You think sometimes that God's not working? God's still at work. You think God has forgotten? God's not forgotten him. And don't you listen to the lie of the devil that said God doesn't care because he cares a whole heap about you and me. Don't you think about that lie that God doesn't remember where you're at? He knows exactly where you're at. Don't get caught in the trap that God has forgotten you. It's the devil that says God's forgotten. God remembered Rachel. He remembers you and I. God remembered Rachel. You see, there was a providential deliverance. He remembered. God responded. He heard Rachel. And God rewarded. He brought Joseph. See, if we're writing the story, we're writing the story of a man named Joseph, a man full of character, a man full of loyalty. A man of honest and an integri- a, a spirit full of integrity. We would not have given Joseph this background. If we were to write the story of a man who was not seeking to exalt himself, but looking to serve others, we would not have given him the parents that we gave him, would we? If we looked for a man who was wise in his decisions, we, have not, we would not have put him in this family, would we not? You see, in spite of... His family, in spite of the circumstances, Joseph was faithful to God. God rewarded Rachel, the Bible says that, and brought Joseph. The name Joseph, the Bible says, means the Lord shall add to me another son, verse 24. Or the definition is God shall increase, God will double. We'll see throughout, throughout the story of Joseph that God did just that. God brought to Rachel one more son, two sons. But God also brought two sons to Joseph, a double rewarding, the double of the double. The hand of God, always bigger than we think. What's your excuse? Well, I, I, I'd be faithful. I'd be loyal if it weren't for my circumstances. I'd be genuine. I'd be honest if it weren't for my family, if it weren't for this situation. What's your excuse? George Whitfield, famous preacher, revival preacher, preached 3,000 times on this topic, ye must be born again. He preached himself to the point of exhaustion and used his voice until his throat was bleeding and raw. And then a crowd gathered outside his bedroom and Whitfield stood there with a candle and said, I'll preach until the candle goes out. He did and then he laid down and went to heaven. What's your excuse? You see, it's not success that God rewards, but faithfulness in doing his will. I wonder what, in spite of circumstances, you have in your life. 
I wonder what, in spite of circumstances, you've been blaming God on and becoming bitter toward and saying, God, I would serve you. God, I would be faithful to you. God, I would give to you. I, I would love you if you hadn't allowed this in my life. If you hadn't brought this to my life, or if you'd blessed me this way, if you gave me what I really wanted. I see the dysfunction of Joseph's home. In spite of that, Joseph is a man of character, a man of loyalty, a man of respect, a pillar of godliness. What's your excuse? Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your faithfulness. And Lord, sometimes in our lives, there are decisions that are made, sometimes from those around us who we love, or those who we respect, that can bring some in spite of circumstances. Lord, may we not use those as an excuse not to be faithful to you. Lord, may we look at the life of Joseph and know that you work all things together for good. That someone may mean it for evil, but you meant it for good because you had a bigger purpose. One, if you're here this morning with your heads bowed and eyes closed, wonder if you are living in it in spite of circumstance. Or maybe you've responded to something. Not like Joseph, but in a way that is understandable, but wrong. Maybe there's some bitterness there, some hurt. But I wonder if you're here this morning and maybe that's how you came in, but God touched your heart today. The Holy Spirit touched you and said, listen, you can get this right. You can still be faithful to me. You can still love me. You can still follow me. You can still believe God. I wonder who would say this morning, Pastor, would you pray for me? As you spoke, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Would you pray for me that, that I would in my life make the decision I need to make? And maybe there's some hurt there. Maybe there's some heartache, some misunderstanding. Would, who would say, Pastor, pray for me because I want to honor God through this. I want to stay faithful to God through this. And I'm, maybe I'm struggling right now. Would you pray for me, though? Lift your hand up and back down. We'll pray for you this morning. Amen. Amen. Who else? God touched my heart this morning. Would you pray for me? Amen. Amen. I wonder if you're here this morning. You never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I've never trusted Christ. I'd like to know how. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? I'll draw no more attention to you than did anyone else. Just slip your hand up and back down real quick. We'll acknowledge that. Lord, I pray for those who lifted a hand. Lord, would they bend a knee and bend their heart towards you. Lord, bless this time of invitation. Lord, no matter what comes in our life, we can keep our eyes on you and stay faithful to you. Lord, bless those who raised a hand. Now help them to turn towards you in this area. In Jesus' name.